What's happening guys? We are a few weeks out from the Rogue Invitational. We are going to work on some axle pressing today. First out the rack and then do some cleaning presses. I'm getting back to 100%. So we're going to try to press something pretty decent out of the rack and see if we can't get close to what I'm going to have to do at Rogue over when we do cleaning presses. So wish me luck. Comment what you think I'll be able to hit for a single on axle overhead press. How does pressing with an axle differ from pressing with a barbell, if at all? A lot. <laughs> the, uh, the change in the having no whip in the bar, even if it's a, a fairly stiff barbell, it's, it's so different when it's an axle. And then the wider the implement, the less you can bend your hand back. Because a barbell, you could sit up here and get it right up on your collarbones with an axle. It has to sit in the meat of your hand because it's so wide. There's no real good way to get it up onto your chest properly. So all of those things in implementation turn into things like your phase between your dip and your drive. It has to be a little bit more careful than a barbell where you can really fire in because you don't have that same stability with the axle. It's hard to keep it on your body. You'll see a lot of guys when they press the axle who are bigger no matter how heavy it is, they'll have the axle at their chin and then try to lock it up from there. I find it okay to sit on my shoulder blade or my collarbone still, but it is a little bit more difficult. That was pretty good. Yeah, gonna put on some elbow support and keep working up. That is just shy of 180 kilos. The thing is, out of the rack is always harder than when you clean and press it. It's a weird thing for me, but I feel like if I own the weight first and I handle it a little bit, then it's up to my shoulders, it feels like it just sits a little bit lighter. Like I know what to expect. Almost like the second rep on a deadlift is usually easier than the first. Similar sort of feeling, so. Working up to something like that fairly easily on this, we're happy. Ooh. Well, well, well. That's pretty fun. I'm very happy with that. Little split jerk action. You like that flare. If I could do that efficiently, it would be lights out. There's a couple commenters actually in previous videos asking why more strong men don't do a split jerk and I think probably skill. just mobility and skill it's just skill yeah and to be honest the skill to develop it takes so much technical practice it's not in the behavior of a strong man to like do that much technical practice and not put more weight on the bar How are those feeling? Pretty good all in all. I didn't put my elbows on 
and it's after doing heavy presses there. So I think I could be even a little bit cleaner on the presses, but triple it, maybe comp wet is uh, really good. And as I get more confident in extending, it'll be easier and easier. So yeah, hold is good. That's a great step forward. I think if I'm not five plus by the time comp rolls around, remembering this doesn't have knurling, the part that we're gonna use does. So if I don't hit five and comp, I'll be very surprised. You've mentioned many times the mouth guard helps with overhead stability. Why is that? I have reason, but it's one of those things that like, it just feels better. Now, my reason is that I think if you have something in your mouth, you're more likely to squeeze down and squeeze down without reservation. And how the spinal column works is that if you activate neurons higher up, makes everything down chain more active. So if you can activate the ones highest up in your mouth, then my theory is that then it, it helps everything else in your body. There's a lot of research around proper alignment of the jaw and how, how that helps with power output. There's research around oxygen uptake and wearing the mouthpiece, but it's one of those things that it just feels better. And it's very rare that I would buy into something that doesn't, that I don't fully understand the science. But when I went to start working with them, I used the mouthpiece first. I, I had no idea who sent it to me. I just figured I'd give it a crack. It worked straight away and I, I used it my prep into the Arnold. And I went into their website and I looked at their research and thought like, okay, that's cute that you found like some people to support you. And then I went onto Google Scholar, went onto PubMed. I was looking at mouthpieces for performance and there's so many different areas in which there's evidence. And anyone sort of skeptical, I encourage you, just go look up Google Scholar, mouthpiece strength, mouthpiece aerobic performance. And it's pretty crazy how good the evidence is for something so simple. So I benefit from you guys buying this. There's no question about that, um, but it's one of those things that it just works straight away. Um, so if you're interested, link will be in the description of the video. Um, but I, I always say this, I'm in a very fortunate position to have chosen every single one of the partners that I work with. And these are one of them. So uh, I don't need to partner with any more people. I just partner with people who fit my vision. My vision is to get more people moving, more people stronger, you to understand why you get better, why you get injured, how you progress from your injury. And this aligns with that. As funny as that sounds, as uh, unusual on the surface as that is, it's just, it's a product that's so simple, uh, but I really believe it. So explain to me again what you're trying out there. Well, in free solo, they hyperventilate to get rid of excess CO2, which is the primary driver of the feeling of breathlessness. So if you can get excess CO2 or you feel less breathless on something like this, that'd be useful. Who knows? Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Worth a shot. You're talking about something with Quinn that I think would be good to reiterate on yeah, camera. You're, you're talking about how your training hasn't changed over the years. It's felt the same, that you're still yeah. pushing yourself hard. And I think a lot of people think that the world's strongest man does something so different than what yeah. they are doing. And uh, it might be good <coughs> to just re like, talk about that a little bit, expand on it a little bit. Yeah, I'm just lucky that my genetics take me to the level of the world's strongest man, but the goal was always just to keep pushing myself as hard as I could. And the same real basic principles apply. So whether that's load intensity, volume of recovery, anything like that, it's not anything, if you looked at my program, it wouldn't be anything revolutionary and special. What a great coach does is more soft skills than hard skills. If you have a decent education, a decent experience level, you'd be able to write a pretty good program, but how to cater to individuals is the real challenge. So yeah, it's not anything like, hyper-revolutionary, nothing like that. And like I was saying, heavy feels heavy, whether heavy is a thousand pounds or heavy is 500 pounds, 
to me that's felt the same all the way. I'm saying the only difference is that now the consequence when something doesn't go perfectly is so much higher because you're stronger and the weights are higher, the room for error is smaller. So simply a little bit more careful, a little bit more intent. Otherwise, same, same. Oh. So isometrics, always for tendon strength. With some events coming up, I know bicep tear is a risk. Throw in some isometrics and do everything you can to minimize the risk of something bad happening. That being said, that was pressing day. Hope you guys enjoyed. That was pretty successful for me. Pretty strong. I'm getting back to where I should be. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. How do you think I'm going to go in a few weeks' time? Uh, otherwise, merch link in the bio if you guys want to support. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you. Lift heavy. Be kind, and we'll see you next time.